South Africa is known for being the biggest population of HIV positive people in the world. We have about 6 million people who are HIV positive, and that's just in the public sector. Of those 6 million people, are 110,000 are children. For a disease that's basically 35 years old, um, it's great to be able to say that we have some excellent treatments and they work really well. HIV in South Africa now is a lifestyle disease. It's a little bit like diabetes, um, like hypertension and obesity. It's something that people live with. And we don't say that because we're being politically correct. People are not dying as much of HIV as they used to. People think it's frightening and, you know, you must have treatment tomorrow, but it's a very slow virus, at least months and sometimes years before we even know um, that patients have it. It's a round, ball-shaped virus, and the outside has pods that help with attachments. Inside this round virus, there's a capsid, which is a spindle-shaped thing, um, and inside those two little green worm-like things are positive RNA strands. That makes it a retrovirus. A retrovirus means that the RNA um, virus can insert into the host cell so that when infection happens, your host cell starts to actually produce virus DNA. The cells that are affected are any immune cells, but typically they are the T helper cells with CD4 on the surface. So we usually call them CD4 cells. And ironically, those are the very cells that are supposed to identify infections when they first arrive. We look at the risk for any disease, the risk of not being able to see, the risk of losing vision in the long term. So when you look at something like HIV, you're also going to try and determine whether your patient is at risk. When you take a history when an HIV-positive patient sees you, depending on what they answer, you can assess their risk and their level of care. If you're going to ask them what their last CD4 count was, or sometimes I call them a T-cell count, and they don't know what you're talking about, then you worry a little bit. If you want to know what their viral load is, and they don't know what that is, then you worry a little bit more. The official definition of AIDS is when your CD4 count goes below 200. Even if it goes back up after that, you don't go back to becoming HIV positive. Once your CD4 count is dipped below 200, you remain classified as AIDS, only because you might have been exposed to infections at that time, which will still remain dormant and can be reactivated fairly quickly. The first time you test the patient, they do a rapid test. The response is within 20 or 30 minutes, and they're getting very, very accurate. Rapid tests are pinprick and blood. The more common ones are saliva and urine. They'll do one, and then if it's positive, they'll do another one to confirm. And even if that one is positive, you will draw blood and send it to the lab and um, do the ELISA test, which checks for antibodies and is much more conclusive. Ocular complications, um, LIDS and adnexa, I think these are things that you see fairly frequently, so um, they're not HIV-specific, and so I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. I think when we dispense, we can look very carefully. When you measure a seg height, you can look at the lid margin. I mean, it's where the margins come together where the biggest risk is. Of course, we have UV in South Africa, which you've only heard of. Um, and so there's exposure to sunlight, which activates a lot of this. Um, sebaceous carcinomas, if you have patients with myobionitis or hordeola that don't go away. Um, an index of suspicion is always there, and it's not only with the patients with HIV. These are things that happen to other patients as well who have normal immune systems. Molluscum, fairly normal in children, but if you get them in older patients, um, then worry about them. Um, they're two different strains, and um, the HIV-positive one is more commonly the MCV2. Herpes zoster we see a lot of, and it's a, both a lid and a cornea problem. If you've had chicken pox, you have herpes zoster, and it's just waiting there, sitting to bite. If you are then immune depressed, then it will come back. So it's not uncommon in older people. Um, we use systemic acyclovirin, supposed to help with the, with the post-herpetic neuralgia, but unfortunately doesn't work very well in um, HIV-positive patients with that. In patients who are immune normal, early treatment with acyclovir does help to, to reduce that neuralgia. They also don't behave like the textbooks. They don't look the way that they should. Normally, I found that there's sort of a spotty cloudiness of the, of the stroma. Kaposi sarcoma, I included this one for you. It's very, very common in the inferior fornix and around the skin. You can see this just um, next to his eye there at the canthus. That might be another one. It could be a child with just a normal subconjunctival heme. So, you know, it might be something that you say will go away in two weeks' time. But this actually turned out to be a Kaposi sarcoma. Ulcers, also, we are much more careful about um, people who have HIV, um, and we treat them much more carefully. 
whereas a patient with a normal ulcer, I might start with the antibiotic and the steroid at once. I'll hold back on the steroid if the patient is HIV positive. Uveitis, the most common uveitis that we see is the rebound uveitis when people have been on the heart treatment for a couple of months and they actually have the immune system to launch a uveitis because if you don't have the immune capacity, you can't have an inflammatory reaction. Ocular TB um, happens a lot with HIV. Um, you'll see inflammatory signs, um, kippies, nodules quite often, pigment on the endothelium. And the medication, if you see any patients on TB, you want to watch very carefully because the medications are awful. The most common one is ethambutol, and I just recently had a patient who, within a week, went from 6.6 to 6.60 um, on ethambutol. And it's not the TB, it's the medication. So if you have patients on these, and some of them, if they're drug resistant, it's enormous doses. So industrial doses of this stuff, um, it is dose-related. Send the patients home with a VA chart and tell them to check their VA every day. I do see a lot of cotton wool spots. Um, and that's probably antigen-antibody complexes depositing, which causes the axoplasmic flow to be blocked. The difference is between a cotton wool spot and CMV. You don't want to confuse them because cotton wool spots go away and CMV definitely doesn't go away. The difference is that the CMV tends to be peripheral. Cotton wool spots will be more diffuse. Um, and CMV is kind of flatter. Cotton wool spots do appear to be fluffy, as the name suggests. The other thing is you want to not confuse the cotton wool spots with those um, that are caused by diabetes. The difference being that diabetes has often hard exudates as well. One of the things that the American lecturers often say to me, um, or say to all of us, is that when you hear hooves, you must think horses, not zebras. Now, of course, coming from Africa, I do think zebras. And I think the message for you is that you must understand your area, and you know your area better than anyone else. Be open to this um, and, and know what your population is at risk for. Um, and when horses are appropriate, think horses, but sometimes zebras are appropriate. So understand where you work um, and whether you work in the private or the public sector and the type of community that you serve. I hope that you will go back to your practices and not, not expect that everyone is HIV positive, but consider that there might be things that you're missing and use the opportunity to educate your patients about this condition.